You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 58 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. Back with us this week is Matt Lowe. Yo! And the brains of the operation, Jessica Salaji. Hello. Matt, how did the wood chopping go? <laughs> Man, we actually, we wound up with uh, a lot more wood than we needed, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to the point where, you know, some things are just too easy. They're teed up. I'm going to leave that one alone. Right. Yeah, Jessica snorted for it, so... <laughs> Jessica will be quick to, to react. I did not snort. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Jessica, how was your week? Good. Tomorrow is the last day of legislative session. Woo! Yes. I can't wait. Send those assholes home. <laughs> right. Then the taxpayers of Georgia will be safe for another eight months. Until Kemp starts signing everything. Uh, right. Will they really be safe? I mean, because everything they've done will just start taking effect. No, we'll get a really bad rainstorm. <laughs> They'll have a, a special session and give a bunch of money to Delta again or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm just fresh off of a town hall with a bunch of NIMBYs. Mm-mm. Man, I knew that was coming. Well, that Facebook group... There was a Facebook group that got all these people stirred up uh, for a road widening that's not going to happen until 2023. Like, there's plenty of time. Uh, They had them stirred up thinking this was going to start in April. Uh, And and packed this place out. And the the commissioners just got basically got to sit back and listen to the county engineer or the DOT engineer just get hammered left and right from these people. And I just, it was, it, it was, it was awful. It, you know, my wife was with me and she's like, oh man, I can't just, we got to get home and get a drink. We need to get out of here. This is awful. Man, that's, I wish I'd have been there. Cause I know George obviously, cause he sits in there um, and handles any road stuff that comes up with uh, planning and zoning. And he is a, he's a brilliant guy. And I am absolutely certain that those dumbasses ask some insanely stupid questions that, that it, I mean, I wasn't there, but I can only assume that it was like beneath him to be even answer them. Well, no, it wasn't even questions. It was pointed like, forget your statistics and your math. Let me tell you about my anecdotes. <laughs> Never mind your traffic study. Exactly. Exactly. I go to work at 1030. And then they actually said, we need a good engineer. And like a few of us looked over like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like there were two engineers in there because uh, they had the, you know, the whole, all the county departments in there and like two like really smart guys. But you may not like the fact the county's growing, but it is. So anyway, that's enough Paulding County stuff. I don't nobody really cares about Paulding County, but it, it that is the ugly side of of like local politics is is the NIMBY stuff and the the rooms being packed with with opposition, which you know they really represent such a small number overall of the residents. They're just the loudest, right? And God, they're loud. Yeah, they are. Well, I, and also, I mean, they are that area of the county makes up for a large portion of the tax base not by numbers of taxed but the values of their property well yeah overall they have the most dense higher property value they're they're the upper middle class area and they think that they're all the rich folks you know true rich folks don't live in neighborhoods <laughs> right. so off of Paulding County and on to Burning Man. The feds want you searched for drugs if you go to Burning Man. Now, Burning Man is a week-long event, uh, a temporary community where 
it's bands and parties and weird art exhibits. And at the end, they burn a big statue. That's where it comes to Burning Man. And the company hosting the event uh, is being mandated by the Bureau of Land Management uh, to authorize searches of individuals. Is that about right, Jessica? Am I, am I reading the notes correctly? Yes, you're right. But I think even worse is that they're also, like, you have to get a permit to use the public land, which, whatever. But you have to get a permit. And as a contingency of the permit this year, they're requiring that the company contract with a BLM approved third party private security company for the purposes of screening and searching and everything. So, it's not even like when you have an event in a, at like a city community center and they want you to get an off-duty cop. Like, no, they want your, their, their approved private security. And then that private security is under obligation to report any mischief to the, to the police. Right. <clears throat> Actually, I, I half read this uh, on my phone. I kept seeing BLM, BLM. I'm like, what the hell does Black Lives Matter have to do with Burning Man? Nice. <laughs> no, They're like man. in the world of acronyms, they can't keep up. I, I'm used to that one because... Yes, you, public lands. You, yeah, when you go hunting out west, it's national forests, national monuments, and BLM land. So on the maps, it's all in yellow. So. <laughs> now, how is this not a Fourth Amendment issue if the government is mandating that it be done, even if it's by a private uh, security agency. So when I read the first, when I, the article that I read was on reason and it was one of those where like, as I was reading, I was like, okay, I see that point. Okay. I see the other side. Like I understand that it's on public land and that you need a permit and that they can set, I mean, we've allowed the federal government to set rules and re- give these, these agencies r- the power to set rules and regulations for, this type of stuff. I think this goes a little far. And I think it's n- one of the reasons that it's not right is because they're not requiring everyone to do this. Like not every event that happens on public land is subject to re- like mandated private security that answers to law enforcement. And they're making them produce a report 30 days after to, to indicate like everything that happened in any, any reports that they did make to law enforcement. Not cool. So after reading it and getting through all of it, I, I'm against it. I I think you make concessions when you use public land, but I think this goes a little far. I would agree with that. Now, Matt, this is sort of mirrors the uh, um, the, the investiga- rainbow people. Yes, yes that's the investigative reporting that you did for this show a few months back on the uh, on on the rainbow family and uh, up there the the trout stream. Right. Other than the rainbow people, they seem to have a, a forestry service tactical team that's like permanently assigned to them. And as opposed to a, a private company running security. Right. But that was actual federal employees that were completely Correct. violating the Fourth Amendment and, and just. <laughs> right. Searching dirty hippies because you know they they like that the devil's lettuce, right? It's I don't know. It's and you get into so much weird stuff because BLM land. It's while you can get on it, like it just falls into a whole different management category than. I mean, that's what uh, the um, the Bundys. You know, um, I can't remember his first name, the cattle guys that, right. sparked, that sparked that standoff. That was over BLM land. And that was, it was BLM enforcement over there that did that. I don't know if you saw, but a judge tossed that whole case. Yeah, and it was over grazing rights, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the oldest story in the West. <laughs> right. So uh, they, I, I don't know. They just have, they have a whole set of tools at their disposal for management of the land that, that they don't have in other, in other federal lands. So, and I'm not that familiar with it mostly because while I do hunt on it, when I go out West, uh, we don't have any BLM land here in Georgia. So I don't. To God be the glory. 
<laughs> I just don't I don't I don't know enough about it to really speak very intelligently about it. How or anything else. Shh. Yeah, you know the the tendency here is to not care because outsiders see Burning Man as a what appears to be a group of, you know, crazy lefty drug druggy type people. You know, granola, no shower, you know, arm, hairy armpit type folks. Uh, right. So, but the fact is, when you open the door to stuff like this, it, it swings open for everyone. And right. if we tolerate, we can't, I should say, we, sh- we can't tolerate rights, anybody's rights being trampled in this country, regardless of what we think of their lifestyle. Right. I mean, you know, what happens when uh, the na- you know, they decide to start, I don't know, stopping every hunter that comes out of the National Forest or off BLM land in, in southern Colorado, crossing into New Mexico to head home and searching them just because they've been in Colorado. Well, let's tie this back to some of the other stories that we've covered this month. And they start doing shakedowns, <clears throat> you know. You're coming, you're coming out of Colorado. Let's just go ahead and pull you over, search you. How much money do you have on you? Well, you couldn't have gotten that. Let's, let's seize that, those assets. How, did, how could you afford this car? Let's take that. Uh, you know, I know I'm talking slippery slope, and it's a, that's, tends that's to be a That's how it happens, though. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. But it's, once we swing the door open to that, we're saying we're okay with the federal government skirting the Fourth Amendment that really has no teeth anymore. Just because we're they're using private security to enforce federal law, right? So I, I, I don't know. No, I was going to toss it to you anyway, Jessica. Go ahead. I just I don't think I don't think it's right. I don't think it's being applied equally. And then this is a pretty big thing with seventy thousand people. Like how how many people? Are they going to have to hire? And I just, you're, you're not only are you imposing infringement or not only infringing on people's rights, you're also like driving up the cost of the event because how many people is it going to take to search and check cars for 70,000 people? Just bad all across the board. And it's not going to stop anything. Right. It's not going to stop anybody from from bringing drugs in. They'll use drones. They'll 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 they'll, they'll use a t shirt cannon like that chick did trying to t- trying to deliver drugs and uh, and stuff to her boyfriend in prison. It will find a way in there. Leave them alone. Let them have let them have their fun. Yeah, you know, the organizers can can set their own rules. So when I, the typical libertarian response is, is this really the most important thing? Like our government, like, is this really the most important thing we need to be worried about too? <laughs> right. <laughs> the list of a hundred things to worry about. Is yeah. this on it? No. <laughs> well, for a libertarian standpoint is at least they're outsourcing it to, uh, <laughs> to private enterprise. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're contracting out your infringements this year, guys. Enjoy. Yeah, not just that, they're pushing off the cost of that on to the promoters. So the federal government's not paying these these contractors directly. Now they can have two special agents hanging out just waiting for the reports to roll in. God, everyone sucks. Speaking of government overreach, should license plate scanners require no. a warrant? Yes. No license plate scanners ever. I hate those things. I hate them. This is like not your traditional question, though. I don't know. This is about police using a cam- a commercial database, like maintained by a private company, and the private company is allowing the police to do it. So traditionally, you know, we would like again, you would think, okay, well, if the company is collecting the data, which they're allowed to do under the law, but like even here in Georgia, like tow truck companies go around and check the license plates and parking lots. They collect all that data. They put it in a database. And they're allowing the police to come to their office and search the database. And they can do that without a warrant. 
um, the states and F have filed a, um, a suit saying that even if they are getting it like on a consensual basis, they should still have a warrant. And interestingly, like the courts have ruled on this time, time again. And in the past, they've said we have a, like we, the people have a right to know how the police are using the technology. So this is another one I feel like just like the last one that isn't just like cut and dry. I mean, it, it, the answer is clear of what it is, but you can see why there are other. Right. I mean, that's a, that's just, I hate, uh, like I really <clears throat> despise the term slippery slope, but that that's exactly what that is. The minute that a private company is allowed without a warrant to open up their files. I mean, what's that going to do? Think about Google or Apple or Samsung. Well, you have an agreement with Google and Samsung as far as privacy goes. Uh, yeah, but they, they'll they change the terms of that agreement. Oh, sure they do. <laughs> I mean, all they got to do, and, it, and it'll be hidden in a 17,000 word document that they send to me. That you Just, read oh, by every, the way, yeah, we're you, changing this. Yeah, I read it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, scroll agree. Yeah, click agree. Give me my Google machine, damn it. <laughs> yeah, give me my Angry Birds. <laughs> but but the difference and what's interesting about this is you know like a lot of our tech companies are huge advocates for privacy and have gone to court in favor of the people and blocking the government and saying no, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You know, and they, I mean, trying to get subpoenas and things processed, even in, in legitimate cases, like those companies make law enforcement go through hoops. They don't just turn it over the next day. Like if you just go to the website where you, like for Microsoft or Yahoo, and you read the process that law enforcement has to go into to get information, it's rather extensive. So my thing is, is why are these commercial license plate databases willing to offer that information like when when the trend truly is on the side of the people and to make it more difficult for law enforcement what's in it for this company to not right well and the thing about tow truck drivers is they're going to cooperate with police because they get a good bit of their business from them so i really the the how did we get, you know, this is two stories where Matt and I both said we hate slippery slope arguments, but how did we get here? How do we get to the point where your vehicle has an identification on there that's being tracked everywhere it goes? Right. Why are we scanning license plates? Yeah, I And mean, some of them have photos of you and your passengers. Oh, absolutely. Well, how long before you run for office and it comes up? Mr. Lowe, you sure did spend a lot of time at the Foxy Lady Lounge. Right. Well, at least your car did. <laughs> Ecstasy. No, I was at Passion City Church next door. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of work with Faith, Hope, and Charity. They work the lunch shift over at the, over at the Claremont Lounge. <laughs> Back to strippers. <laughs> no, but, it, it, but it's going to... Soon enough, that, that information is going to be available to the public. And you're going to be able to track anybody. And you're going to just be able to track anybody through their, through their license plate uh, or their peach pass. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to track speed, how long you were somewhere. I mean, it, it's... God, could you imagine that? You get a ticket. <laughs> Your peach pass was dinged here and here. These were the time codes. <laughs> this we're not, is how fast you were going. Here's your ticket. We're not far off. I mean, speed cameras exist. They're all over Europe. Don't, but I, don't those typically, at least here in the States when they've tried it, don't those typically get tossed? Like the red light cameras don't those usually get tossed if they're fought? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they do. 
Uh, but they generate so much, uh, so much revenue for people who get the ticket and just pay it. I mean that red light cameras and speed cameras just admit that it has nothing to do with safety. It has everything to do with revenue. You know, I think Matt, uh, you and I were talking one day and, and you kind of nailed the, uh, super speeder not being tied to, uh, tied to safety at all is it had, if it had anything to do with safety, you would just revoke your li- revoke the person's license right there. That's what I said about they should do about this texting and driving that law that was last it. year. That was it. Yeah. That that I told I told when I I had a a meeting with a local state rep, and he wanted my thoughts on it. And the position that he took was that it is truly about safety. And I was like, then revoke a license. Don't make it about money. And that's where he messed up. Was asking for your opinion. Right. <laughs> but I mean, don't you think this is this kind of ties back to the DNA stuff that we talked about with law enforcement using the DNA databases? Like we're really we, technology is advancing so much faster than the government, obviously. But I mean, we're we're at a point where like the tools that the private sector have developed are so much more advanced than what the government resources are and so yeah in some cases it makes sense for them but how do you regulate i mean our laws should absolutely restrict the government like in all the in the most the strictest of ways i support that but are you not some are you also restricting a a, an entity by saying no you can't enter into a contract with the government and setting parameters for that Well, the DNA thing is interesting, and, and since we've done that story, I've seen five or six things pop up where crimes are being solved with the with, uh, DNA databases that are coming from the, the private sector. The, the key difference with that is you volunteer to send your DNA into one of these, these research companies. That's a good point. You have no choice. You can't ride around without a tag. But driving is a privilege, not a right. I mean, that's the argument. I don't agree with that, but that's the argument that they say, well, you don't. But my thing is, is what you're talking about. These license plates are collected on private property a lot of times. Like they drive around and just collect to store. Right. Yeah. These are private parking lots. Uh that they're collecting, that they're getting this, this data from. It's not even, not, man, I, you might as well just be driving around with your driver's license stuck to the back of your car. You know, you asked a question, Jessica, and I think I'm, I'm going to back up because you asked about limiting private companies that enter into contracts with the government. And I think I'm okay with that. I, like if you're, if, if you're going to choose to do business with the government, then you just have to understand that right. there's going to be some limitations placed on you because you're dealing with a freaking government. And I don't disagree. I'm just saying, like, that's a question that we're going to continuously have to offer is because everything that the private and enter- the private sector is developing is like has some privacy aspect. So we need to decide so that we can be consistent. Right. That is one thing our government is not. <laughs> Yeah. Freaking government. I mean, not not by a damn sight are we, are we consistent with anything. Uh, we talked about it last week. We can't even be consistent with sentencing minors. Uh, yeah, we're, we're yeah we're way past that. The only thing we can do now is try to get some of the crap back in the horse. Is try to get some of our freedoms back, or at least arrest what's 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 coming out now because the fourth amendment has been eroded to the point where it has almost no meaning. Lucky us. Wow. This is cheerful. (laughs) These cheery opinions are ours and not necessarily those of all on Georgia. Getting into more happy news, dogs trapped in cars. Civil immunity for rescuing dogs in distress from vehicles. It is currently legal to 
to break a window in, in a car uh, for a dog that's, that's maybe stuck in the heat in 14 states. Uh, 14 states allow law enforcement or humane officers to break into cars. Uh, 11 states allow good Samaritans to, to do that. Uh, we had a, a legislation by K. Kirkpatrick, Senate Bill 32, that would relieve civil immunity for breaking into a vehicle to rescue a dog in distress. Also relieves car owner of civil damages if car, uh, dog harms person who breaks in or hurts themselves breaking in. Which I think is like the most ridiculous aspect. Like, who's going to try to rescue a dog and then sue because when they open the door, the dog bit them? Have you met the public? I know. I hate See, everyone. That's why I'm like, I'm. here's an unpopular opinion. I'm against this bill. I like I I I agree with the spirit of it. But, but to give the average person leeway to break my vehicle? No, hell no. I, like I know too many dumbasses. Just no. Well, it, it doesn't. <laughs> what it it requires that they call nine one one or, uh, or I guess uh, animal control. It also, I think, it would ask. It would require them to try to get to contact the owner. Like. If you're outside of Kroger, you, you would go into Kroger and say, hey, listen, the person who owns the Blue Maxima, uh, uh, please come to the front, front of whatever. <laughs> right. Your dog's in the car. Yeah, I know. I left the air conditioner on. It's running. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think that the law is, I think it was a little too broad. And I, it's like, I, I talked, I was talking about this on social media, trying to get feedback because- Dogs make people emotional. Like, people will be irrational talking about their animals. And I'm not immune from that. But if I was in a parking lot on a 100-degree day and I saw a dog, like, starting to, like, lose consciousness in a hot vehicle, I'm whether there's a law there or not, I'm going to do something. Do you know what I mean? Like, a reasonable person doesn't need the law to say... You're going to, you you won't have to pay for damages. Like I'll take my risk. If I really think it's some, whether it's a kid or a dog or whatever, I'll take my, I'll take my risks. Right. No, I agree with that. Well, and Matt, you're talking about the air conditioner running. You should be able to tell the difference between a vehicle running. Right. And the dog's just being an asshole. Like I've got one that like, if I leave my dog in the car, even it, like I could, you could put a sign up on the window that says she's just freaking out. The air conditioning's on, and I'm playing smooth jazz. She's fine. She's just yeah. a jerk. Yeah, she she just she has separation anxiety. In fact, I I was traveling with my dog one day, and I ran into Publix to go to the bathroom. I didn't buy anything. I came back, and she attracted a crowd. There's, that's just so cruel. I'm like, I don't even have a bag. I didn't buy anything. You guys arrest me if I if I take a leak right here. So. I see. I'm, I'm also, but I'm also there, and I, you know, we all know that I have dogs. Um, yeah, but you would put them in Tupperware. <laughs> no, I didn't. Because your wife wouldn't wife let wouldn't you. Let me. But like, I get real irritated. Like, I hate those people that like bring their dog to Home Depot or whatever, I'm like, or Academy or something. You know, PetSmart, fine. It's a pet store. I get that, but you know. Get your dog out of the aisle, you know, the garden aisle at Walmart. That's it. It pisses me off. <laughs> Leave them at home. That's where they belong. Yeah, me too. Um, I was getting my car done today, and I sat next to a quote-unquote uh, working dog that came up and crawled to my lap. I'm like, that's not a service dog. No. Right. Emotional yeah. support dogs. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I think it was KFC or... Uh, uh, our Popeyes had the best thing, the emotional support chicken in the airport. It was a bucket of fried chicken. Nice. Uh, but no, I, no, I'm with with you, Matt. I, I I don't like seeing him in the in the grocery stores. I don't like seeing him in restaurants. My dog goes to the kennel when I travel. I don't take her. I don't impose her in people's houses and all that stuff. But back back on the on this bill, it failed. I mean, I guess it passed miserably. The, it passed the Senate and it failed. Miserably in the house, forty six to one hundred eight. It apparently Which is huge. It's huge that in the Senate only had four dissenting votes, and in the House 
It had 108. That's, I mean, nothing fails. You got to be a real dumbass to have your bill fail. <laughs> so, you know, and I guess uh, Gullet was one that voted for it. I, I saw his comments on, on this bill failing on the interwebs. I'm shocked. He's uh, a cat guy, though. He is a cat guy. Oh, worst picture of his campaign was him sitting with a, uh, as he was campaigning with a constituent, holding her cat. <laughs> it was awesome. All he was missing was like a bad sweater. You know, and the the hyperbole that goes around this, and one of the legislators was saying, no, I agree with, with rescuing an animal in distress, but what about breaking somebody's window when the air condition is running? If you can't tell the difference between a car running and not running and looking in and seeing an air conditioner, you know, knowing the air conditioner is running, I mean, that, that's a special kind of stupid. I mean, you obviously know when an animal looks like they're in distress. Yeah, but again, that's so subjective. I mean... Like I have, I have a, a lady that I'm friends with on Facebook, and like dogs are her thing, right? And everything, everything is like she she managed to tie what was the uh, the that bill that we talked about the property rights thing about um, keeping local agencies from stipulating colors and siding and things like that. Like she even tried to make the argument that it was tied to, to animals and and puppy mills and things like that. Like she sounds nuts. You're right. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, Jessica does too. I'm not going to name her here. Is though. it cat? No, no. Yes. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> I and I like. I just no. I don't want to give her the leeway Dave. to no, to smash no, my no. Eric, bleep the name, please. <laughs> yes, do it. Say, is it bleep? <laughs> yep, it is. <laughs> but you just you can't give people like that the leeway to smash a window because this they're irrational. She'll smash a window over a grammar error. Well, <laughs> but here's the thing: she would still to be insulated from uh, responsibility. She has to follow. Uh, the guidelines within the law. If if she smashes somebody's window and it turns out the air was running, the dog was fine. Like, did you contact police? No. Did you attempt to find the owner? No. Well, you're not insulated. So, yeah, but my window still smashed, and now I got to take her to court to pay for it. Yeah, I mean, you can't in a in a, in a ideal world. I mean, there's an instant and immediate karma for stuff like that. So there's another bill that's proposed, um, the one that we were talking about by Kirkpatrick, because it failed and there was no motion to reconsider, it's dead for the year. Um, but there's Senate Bill 31, which would give the same civil immunity to law enforcement officers who are acting in their official capacity. Like, if you call the police and they get there in time, um, and they break the window... They're not liable, nor is the city or the county or whoever. So, wait a minute. Don't we have problems with cops shooting dogs? Well, I would... I mean, my thing is, we've got problems with law enforcement in their own canines. There were less string of them last year, even here in Georgia, with dogs in hot cars. Right. Other police canines. But I'm not a fan of relieving civil... If it's not good enough for the public, it's not good enough for the police. Right. And what happens when they break the window and, I don't know, see something? What if I have weed in there? Right. Was that probable cause? I mean, I would never leave my dog in the car, but... I thought you were going to say, I would never leave the weed in the car. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't smoke weed, but... She keeps that in her purse. Yeah. It um... dries out. (laughs) Not that special little Tupperware container she has, it's fine. I thought you were supposed to keep it in glass so it doesn't smell. Wow, you know more than either one of us. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, after this legislative session, you could probably use some. Right? It's it wouldn't medicinal. go far enough, I can tell you that much. But, yeah, PTSD is what I'm claiming. But, um, 
No, but I mean, I don't, I'm not a fan. I mean, I know that police officers have certain immunities already, like officer involved shootings and things like that. But I don't know that I'm a fan of giving them immunity. If it, if the answer is that, if or if the reasoning for opposing it, the first one was because people can be unreasonable and you don't know how they'll, if the dog is actually in distress and suddenly now they don't have a window or a dog. Why would you give that power to law enforcement? Someone had to call law enforcement. It's that unra- irrational person. Well, and our police force is supposed to be a citizen police force. Not not anybody above the citizens. It's subject to and enforcing the law. So, no, it... it it really should be even handed across the board. If if uh, you're acting as a good Samaritan, whether you wear a badge or not, it's the question is, are, are you insulated from it? Mm-hmm. What's going to be interesting is when somebody busts the window out of a police car because they think the dog's in distress. You know, you're probably going to jail and you're going to have to pay for the window. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I would. That poor German Shepherd's wearing a, f- a fur coat. If, they, if the air conditioner's not running, that's just wrong. I agree. Not that any of our, you know, police officers around here shut their cars off. Right. I love the argument that it's cheaper to keep them running. I'm like, really? I don't leave mine running when I go in the grocery store. It is not cheaper to keep them running. They don't want to get in a hot car. Right. You know, it's not, it's not in case they have to get in hot pursuit. It's not for any other reason than they don't pay for the gas. And it's not a police officer independently. I walked out when I, uh, when my brother and I were working together, uh, two of the employees were sitting in the car, sitting in the truck, eating lunch with the air conditioner running and the windows down because it was a nice day outside. It's not, it's not, it's wholly of of just law enforcement. It's just people who don't buy their gas tend not to care about it. But, you know, we're we're getting way off on the weeds from from smashing windows. But, you know, I I don't know. I I just think your your point is probably the best is if I'm doing the right thing and, and, and I tell you what, yeah, liability be damned. Right, yeah, exactly. Well, it's just like, I don't, I mean, and you want to get off in the weeds, I'll, I'll tank this thing way down. But there was a story in the news last week where there was a, two fifth graders in South Carolina that got in a fight in the classroom and the one girl stomped on the other girl's head and was like smashing her with objects and stuff to the point that she had to be airlifted out and she died the next day. And the school system said that they had a policy that did not allow teachers to intervene that they had to instead call for administrators. And I was reading it thinking, what kind of dumbass has to wait for a policy, like follows a policy? It's the same thing. Like good people don't need rules and regulations and laws to tell them when to act and when not to act. Use your best judgment. And if you mess up, then you pay the consequences and you pay for the window to be fixed. You're not going to jail. It's a civil issue. And if if you did the right thing and the judge finds in your favor or your the school system in this case finds in your favor, then you're the hero. If not, then you're an adult. Move on. Well, that's the thing is I'd rather lose my job and save a kid's life. Right. But it's the same. I mean, I, I'm not equating a kid to a dog by any means, but it's the same concept in that you either know what, how to behave and when to act and, and, and when to sit on the sidelines or you don't. Right. If your moral compass is pointing true north, it doesn't matter. If it costs you 500 bucks to replace a window, hey, it was the right thing to do. And I'm not minimizing that, you know, that, that if, you know, it would be easy for anybody to, to come up with 500 bucks to replace a window. It's just that if, you're, if your moral compass is, point, is pointing true north, then you will make the right decisions and consequences be damned at least you'll be right (laughs) 
I agree. Well, damn. That doesn't make for very good radio. You guys, you tell me how I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, did a Georgia House prayer violate the Constitution? This was a story in the AJC. It has to do with the father of state representative and majority whip. He gave a, I guess, a fire and brimstone prayer and and every day of the house starts with a prayer and that has been held up that's fine what's the quote the statistics this is a quote from his prayer statistics came out that there's 70 percent of the people in the state of georgia that are lost that are lost 70 percent there are over 10 million people in the state of georgia that means there are 7 million people lost 7 million people that are lost and dying and on their way to hell. That's what it means. That's what that means. Let me get the quote correct. So, the we don't know this for sure, but the implication is that he's referencing, and this was the implication made by a state rep who contacted the Speaker's Legal Counsel, um, is that he's talking about a poll that came out last Friday that was only conducted in swing districts where like Democrats have a strong chance of taking the Republican seat um, in 2020 based on 2018's razor thin margins. But it found that in those specific house districts, which I think there were like 10 or 12 of them, that 70% of those people thought that abortion should be legal in some way or another. You're talking about, the people polled in, let's just say for round numbers, 10 house districts, not 180, 10. So his, his assumption that 7 million Georgians are lost. Like you're basically saying kids are the only ones that aren't lost. Like all the adults in Georgia are lost. I mean, you're, you're doing better than average church statistics, which which claim 90%. So yeah. Way to go, Georgia. I just, so, a real, and really the content is only relevant to the fact that the Supreme Court has said that, yes, you can have legislative prayer, but that it can't go too far and, like, threaten damnation and preach conversion and things like that. And State Representative Josh McLaurin, who is from Sandy Springs, his argument was that this this went that far. It went too far and... It crossed the line of, you know, most of the pastors of the day say, you know, you got to stand for your principles and you got to stand for your convictions and fight for your cons- your constituents and may the Lord's work be done. It's pretty like, you know, anyone, whether you're a faithful person or not, you could take something away from it. This was pretty intense. And I think that he really only got away with it because he's Trey Kelly's dad. Well, and Trey Kelly said his father was citing data from the Georgia Baptist Association about church participation not linked to abortion. Uh, you know, I Matt, does that even make a difference? But you know, I, here's where I'm hung up on it. Right? Is it's a it was a prayer that was ten minutes long. Get out of here with that nonsense. Well, they're all ten minutes long. Look, I mean, you know, unless you're, you're praying over a cancer patient or something like that, you know, your prayer should not be 10 minutes long. Holy crap. Well, they, I mean, arguably they all love getting up there and and being in that quasi pulpit and, and telling everyone that they did and getting their picture taken and everything else. I mean, there's a different aspect to it than just what we're sitting here talking about. Like there's some glory in it. That's why a state rep brought his dad I mean, but my thing is, is who gets up there and says that 70% of Georgia is going to hell? You Um, know, Pastor Kelly. (laughs) Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if from Cedartown. Yeah. If, if, if it's your turn to give the invocation, it really is bow your heads. I hope that each member of this body searches their heart 
and looks to their creator to make the best decisions possible for the people they represent. Something like that. Not 70% of you sons of bitches are going to hell. Right. Oh, if he was talking to the delegation, it'd be more than that. But Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Dear they Lord. Because they sold their souls a long time ago. Dear Lord, flush this toilet. <laughs> Yeah, but you know the Supreme Court ruling, I think, is is so reasonable. As yeah, to, but it's also vague. They are all vague because they that they, they can't be specific. When they're when they're too specific, we we know like like right, you just waltz right around it. No, I know. <laughs> right, when it's too specific, we talk about just like the civil asset forfeiture uh, that they the case that they they heard not long ago that was specifically applied to the 8th and 14th Amendment. Didn't actually, it wasn't broad enough for us. So, you know, they can't win for losing on that. But it says, hey, listen, you can you can have a prayer, but it can't be a recruitment tool. And you basically can't, you know, be con- try to convert people by telling them they're going to go to hell, which is exactly what he did. Apparently, he needed to lay some ground rules for his daddy before he had him in. I just don't think it was, I think it was poor form and, you know, as a Christian, like I appreciate that we have somebody at least trying to, whether, whether you agree with it or not, or allow, I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled that they can do this. So I can appreciate that there's somebody who's trying to offer like a moral compass before they start their day. And I'm disappointed that someone would use it to bring this type of attention to it because... I think there are a lot of people who get a lot out of it and the people who sit up in the gallery and watch, like, it's a good guide. Listen to what they're saying. Don't, don't use it as a platform to draw negative attention to not only prayer and Christianity, but your political positions. Give me a break. I hate when people mix prayer and, and their politics. I hate it. And yeah, and that goes both ways. When you get to the uh, get to the pulpit on Sunday and you're pushing your politics. Don't like it. Right. And don't, don't like when you, when you do it the other way either. Your value should guide or a, a legislator's values. If you can find any should guide his decisions. Now where, you know, being a, f- a faithful person adds to your values, but, uh, I don't know. I I I think poor form was was probably the best way to put it. It you really are the brains of the operation, Jessica. This maybe, is my curse. Maybe old boy just got on a roll. <laughs> I, and he may have. He he may have. He may have gone way off script. Right. I mean, was he nine minutes into his ten minute prayer at this point? And, and he's like, like, and you're going to hell. The hell off the reservation. <laughs> just he's, a, he's getting <laughs> amen, amen. He's like. Oh, I've got him in the palm of my hand, Liddy, and you're going to hell. And he's like, everybody's like, oh, no. And his son's like, oh, shit. Oh, dad, no. <laughs> okay, now, we're not qualified to talk about much. But as three white people, this subject is in our wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing and this. <laughs> Only black reporters allowed in Georgia mayoral race event. Signs at the door, and it was a Savannah mayoral uh, forum. The door said black press only. White reporters were denied entry, while at least two black reporters and the publisher of a local African-American newspaper were allowed inside. The Savannah Morning News reported. Television cameras and recording devices were also prohibited. So I'm all for private events saying their rules and everything. But I mean, in a city like Savannah, like where the mayor, Eddie DeLoach, who is running for reelection, was the first white mayor in decades and has like worked really hard to be inclusive and try to bridge the gap that is race relations in Savannah, like what are you doing? What are you doing? I just threw a water bottle at the cat that's been cr- crying the entire episode. 
No, I'm legitimately asking what Savannah is doing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, I want to know what they're doing. Why are they doing this? Why are they making... Ugh. I, and, mm-mm-mm. I, I don't... How do you... So, when was the last time we, other than a clan meeting, welcomed or didn't welcome people based on race? And, you know, even traditionally black colleges admit white students. All right. So, yeah, to have a to have a black press only event. There's man, no way to talk about this and not sound racist as hell. <laughs> no, no. Not, and <laughs> It's it's not appropriate and it doesn't do anything like, I mean, don't sit here and go after society for, you know, the divide while perpetuating the divide. So this was this was a mayoral race event, correct? It was a private event. Yeah, but I mean, I think that you you start to. Like, you really get into some gray lines there, you know, especially if you're the sitting mayor and it's and it's a campaign event. Like, I, you're really starting to gray some lines about whether this is truly a private event or not, or if it should be treated as a private event. I don't know. If it's at a private venue and I think it was at a church. But I can't, I'm not sure, I don't know for that for sure. But it was at a private venue, it was organized privately, and it's only candidates, not any elected officials. So, I mean, I support what they want, like, do what you want to do, but don't you holler about the racial divide when you're perpetuating it. I don't want to hear it. Right. I have no tolerance for that. I'm sorry. Like, putting a sign up, if, if it's one thing, if you want to, like, have a whisper campaign, like, look, we'd really like to keep this on the DO, but, you know, don't. Just, but putting a sign on the door and turning <laughs> away people who want to cover your event, that is trashy for race relation. Mm-mm. Nothing. You got nothing. <laughs> well, true. And if it's, and it's your party, you can invite anybody you want. But you're right. It's by career. That is how you keep yourself elected. And this is how uh, it's done, is you create a divide. And then you make everybody afraid of it. And then you keep perpetuating it. Because if the divide really went away, if people really got along, like, like you do anytime you actually interact with anybody anywhere, regardless of, of race, gender, uh, or, or sexuality or anything else, when people are people, they get along fine. Well, that doesn't work for the politicians. They need strife. That's where that's where they make their money. So they've got to perpetuate this idea that uh, if you don't if you don't elect, you know the that all these white politicians are out to get us. That's why we had to have a private event just for us to make sure that you know to make sure we could talk freely amongst ourselves, you know, without, without repercussions. But yeah, absolutely. If you, if you were to flip the script, <laughs> All right. If you were to flip the script, you would not find a single politician to show up to it. <laughs> it would be 500 members of the press, like three, three rednecks. And that was it. Nobody else would get near that thing. <laughs> And it'd be a media frenzy in terms of leading up to it. I mean, it would be national news. Well, yeah, it, it would look like a Klan rally where you've got three people marching, 100,000 people protesting, and 50,000 reporters. Mm-hmm. I just think it was poor taste. I mean, again, do what you want, but this was it's 2019. Yeah, and, and that's... We pushed this, I say we, American society pushed the melting pot versus versus the stew pot mentality where you bring every, you know, your 
your culture and you melt it into everybody else. We become a uniquely American culture. And it seems like in modern politics, we're trying to pull that back out. It's we're trying to pull the all the ingredients back out of it and create and create the, the stew pot where you have all individual ingredients thrown thrown together. It's it's counterproductive to what has made this country great for so long. Is we created a uniquely American society and American culture that now they're they're attempting to 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 just I would say destroy but but to regress on and harp back on times that that weren't great in this country equality wise. Yep. Right. Also, I got I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't have an event like this and then tell me you don't like segregation. Right. Because <laughs> that's exactly what you just did. All right. Now that I have eliminated my chance of being president of the NAACP, do we have any closing thoughts? Well, I just want to know when... And I don't, When did we stop caring about gas prices? Um, When they stopped getting above three dollars a gallon yeah but they've been ticking back up slowly and i feel like that's something that americans like used to unite about like not unite against Mm -hmm. to get and we're just not we're not able to get there i I would love to see everyone get riled up about gas prices again especially with crude oil prices being down Mm -hmm. well that's i mean that's just epa regs right now they're geared up doing their summer blends right uh, part of it is economic. People are doing better. People are going on more vacations. They're driving to Disney. They're consuming more fuel. Uh, I think. I think Matt. I think you're right. I think three dollars is the magic is the magic number. There's a a tolerance level that we'll we'll give up to. Right. Yeah. Three dollars and people start people start bitching. At four dollars, they're rioting and selling their SUVs. Well, I remember. You know, I, you know, I run work trucks, spending a thousand dollars a week in fuel in one work truck. Right. Uh, and I remember when it got down to three to three something a gallon, I was taking pictures of it and putting it on Facebook. Look what I found. Right. I paid two ninety nine today. But I also, I also remember Matt. You're my age, uh, at least for another week. We're the same age. Uh, I remember ninety nine cent gas, eighty nine cent gas. Dude, I remember in the winter time. Gas in the seventies. Like yeah, when I mean, I, when I when I first started driving, I could fill up, and I, and I had a, a, a eighty four or eighty six. I don't remember Ford Escort. It was a like an absolute beater. It's a wonder I ever got laid. But I could fill that damn thing up for five bucks because it had a twelve gallon tank. <laughs> it was just. Yeah, I had a uh, talk about redneck seventy six Camaro. <laughs> so for so for ten bucks, I could get I could fill it up, get a uh, get a couple cokes, and go cruising. Right, I like I I legitimately remember when two dollars in gas was something. You could get home. Yeah, you could get home on a dollar if you could scrape up between the seats. Uh, enough quarters, pennies, and dimes. You you could you could get get somewhere. God, we sound old, right? I remember a five dollar bill. Go in, buy a pack of cigarettes, and put the rest on gas, and I was set for the whole weekend. <laughs> and a and a and a dime bag of of weed was still ten dollars. <laughs> I heard that earlier today. Matt, closing thoughts now that we've... We know. <laughs> now, I, so, I don't really have... Like, it's not a whole... It's not a thought. It's more like a story. And it's a it's a story that I heard um, someone talking about on another podcast. And I had to go look it up to see if it was true. And it was. And it was just so fascinating. I'm going to briefly share it here. And it is a story of a, of a black bear in the Chattahoochee National Forest that died. And it died of, like, everything. Like, it cerebral hemorrhaging, respiratory failure, hypothermia, renal failure, heart failure, stroke, like, whatever 
could ail a living mammal, it died from it, right? And it was because there was a DEA agent named Andrew Thornton who became a drug runner. He was like flying out of Columbia and coming across Chattahoochee National Forest up and was dumping out his cocaine in containers to go back and retrieve them later. And he dumped 40 kilos of cocaine and then bailed out of his plane mid-flight um, and got tangled up in his parachute. And ultimately, he hit the ground very hard and didn't live through it. Um, and they start, the the during the course of the investigation, they start, retracing his steps and trying to find his drugs. But all they found was this one very dead bear who was, whose stomach when they did the, on an animal is called a necropsy, uh, was packed full of all 40 kilos of cocaine. (laughs) So this, this bear is now stuffed and sits in like a truck stop in Kentucky. And his name is Pablo Escobar. Mm-mm. I want to party with that guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that, I, that was the most interesting thing that I heard this week, and I found out it was true, so I decided to share it here. Okay, that leaves me. I don't even know, man. I'm at a loss. I <clears throat> right. How do you follow Pablo Escobar? Yeah. How do you follow Pablo Escobar? I'm sorry for the for the whining cat that Eric may have to try to try to try to edit some of it that Lester's having having to listen to. We were gone till just time to record, and she's letting us know that she was unhappy with being left alone with the dog. <laughs> well, you should have had her in your car. I know. I'm about to take that damn cat and lock her in a in a hot car for a while. Get rid of it. Good God, the thing. Bitches throw all the, the time. Throw in the fence with my dogs. Yeah, yeah, I still have to live here. So anyway, on that cheery note, oh, by the way, if you like what you hear, please like and share the podcast. Give us five stars, as many stars as possible. Rate us, share us with your friends, tell people about us. Uh, if nothing else, just for, it's like staring at a train accident. I mean, you just have to listen. For Matt Lowe, Jessica Salagi, I'm Dave Roberts. Talk to you next week. Later. Bye.